The siege of Fort William Henry was conducted in August 1757 by French General Louis Joseph de Montcalm against the British held Fort William Henry. The fort, located at the southern end of Lake George, on the frontier between the British province of New York and the French province of Canada, was garrisoned by a poorly supported force of British regulars and provincial militia led by Lieutenant Colonel George Munro. After several days of bombardment, Munro surrendered to Montcalm, whose force included nearly 2,000 Indians from a large number of tribes. The terms of surrender included the withdrawal of the garrison to Fort Edward, with specific terms that the French military protect the British from the Indians as they withdrew from the area. In one of the most notorious incidents of the French and Indian War, Montcalm's Indian allies violated the agreed terms of surrender and attacked the British column, which had been deprived of ammunition, as it left the fort. They killed and scalped a significant number of soldiers, took his captives women, children, servants, and slaves, and slaughtered sick and wounded prisoners. Early accounts of the events called it a massacre, and implied that as many as 1,500 people were killed, though it is unlikely more than 200 people were actually killed in the massacre. The exact role of Montcalm and other French leaders in encouraging or defending against the actions of their allies, and the total number of casualties incurred as a result of their actions, is a subject of historical debate. The memory of the killings influenced the actions of British military leaders, especially those of British General Geoffrey Amherst, for the remainder of the war. Background the French and Indian War started in 1754 over territorial disputes between the North American colonies of France and Great Britain in areas that are now western Pennsylvania and upstate New York. The first few years of the war had not gone particularly well for the British. A major expedition by General Edward Braddock in 1755 ended in disaster, and British military leaders were unable to mount any campaigns the following year. In a major setback, a French and Indian army led by General Louis Joseph de Montcalm captured the garrison and destroyed fortifications in the Battle of Fort Oswego in August 1756. In July 1756 the Earl of Loudoun arrived to take command of the British forces in North America, replacing William Shirley, who had temporarily assumed command after Braddock's death. British planning Loudoun's plan for the 1757 campaign was submitted to the government in London in September 1756 and was focused on a single expedition aimed at the heart of New France, the city of Quebec. It called for a purely defensive postures along the frontier with New France, including the contested corridor of the Hudson River and Lake Champlain between Albany, New York and Montreal. Following the Battle of Lake George in 1755, the French had begun construction of Fort Carillon near the southern end of Lake Champlain, while the British had built Fort William Henry at the southern end of Lake George and Fort Edward on the Hudson River, about 16 miles south of Fort William Henry. The area between William Henry and Carillon was a wilderness dominated by Lake George that historian Ian Steele described as a military waterway that left opposing cannons only a few days apart. Loudoun's plan depended on the expedition's timely arrival at Quebec so that French troops would not have the opportunity to move against targets on the frontier, and would instead be needed to defend the heartland of the province of Canada along the St. Lawrence River. However, political turmoil in London over the progress of the Seven Years' War both in North America and in Europe resulted in a change of power, with William Pitt the Elder rising to take control over military matters. Loudon consequently did not receive any feedback from London on his proposed campaign until March 1757. Before this feedback arrived he developed plans for the expedition to Quebec, and worked with the provincial governors of the 13 colonies to develop plans for a coordinated defense of the frontier, including the allotment of militia quotas to each province. When William Pitt's instructions finally reached Loudoun in March 1757, 
They called for the expedition to first target Louisbourg on the Atlantic coast of Isle Royal, now known as Cape Breton Island. Although this did not materially affect the planning of the expedition, it was to have significant consequences on the frontier. The French forces on the St. Lawrence would be too far from Louisbourg to support it, and would consequently be free to act elsewhere. Loudon assigned his best troops to the Louisbourg expedition, and placed Brigadier General Daniel Webb in command of the New York frontier. He was given about 2,000 regulars, primarily from the 35th and 60th regiments. The provinces were to supply Webb with about 5,000 militia. French planning following the success of his 1756 assault on Fort Oswego, Montcalm had been seeking an opportunity to deal with the British position at Fort William Henry, since it provided the British with a launching point for attacks against Fort Carillon. He was initially hesitant to commit his limited resources against Fort William Henry without knowing more about the disposition of British forces. Intelligence provided by spies in London arrived in the spring, indicating that the British target was probably Louisbourg. This suggested that troop levels on the British side of the frontier might be low enough to make an attack on Fort William Henry feasible. This idea was further supported after the French questioned deserters and captives taken during periodic scouting and raiding expeditions that both sides conducted, including one resulting in the January Battle on Snowshoes. As early as December 1756, New France's governor, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, began the process of recruiting Indians for the following summer's campaign. Fueled by stories circulated by Indian participants in the capture of Oswego, this drive was highly successful, drawing nearly 1,000 warriors from the Pays d'Eno to Montreal by June 1757. Another 800 Indians were recruited from tribes that lived closer to the St. Lawrence. British preparations Fort William Henry, built in the fall of 1755, was a roughly square fortification with bastions on the corners, in a design that was intended to repel Indian attacks but was not necessarily sufficient to withstand attack from an enemy that had artillery. Its walls were 30 feet thick, with log facings surrounding an earthen filling. Inside the fort were wooden barracks two stories high, built around the parade ground. Its magazine was in the northeast bastion, and its hospital was located in the southeast bastion. The fort was surrounded on three sides by a dry moat, with the fourth side sloping down to the lake. The only access to the fort was by a bridge across the moat. The fort was only capable of housing four to five hundred men. Additional troops were quartered in an entrenched camp 750 yards southeast of the fort near the site of the 1755 Battle of Lake George. During the winter of 1756-57, Fort William Henry was garrisoned by several hundred men from the 44th foot under Major Willaire. In March 1757 the French sent an army of 1,500 to attack the fort under the command of the governor's brother, Pierre de Rigaud. Composed primarily of colonial troops de la marine, militia, and Indians, and without heavy weapons, they besieged the fort for four days, destroying outbuildings and a large number of watercraft before retreating. Air and his men were replaced by Lieutenant Colonel George Monroe and the 35th Foot in the spring. Monroe established his headquarters in the entrenched camp, where most of his men were located. French preparations The Indians that assembled at Montreal were sent south to Fort Carillon, where they joined the French regiments of B.E.Q.T.R.N. and Royal Roussillon under François-Charles de Bourlimac, and those of Lassalle, Guyenne, Languedoc, and La Reine under François de Gaston, Chevalier de Réalicute V.I.s combined with the troops de la marine, militia companies, and the arriving Indians, the force accumulated at Carillon amounted to 8,000 men. While at Carillon, the French leadership had difficulty controlling the behavior of its Indian allies. 
although they did stop one group from forcing a British prisoner to run the gantlet. A group of Ottawa's were not stopped when it was observed that they were ritually cannibalizing another prisoner. French authorities were also frustrated in their ability to limit the Indians' taking of more than their allotted share of rations. In another prelude of things to come, a large number of prisoners were taken on 23 July in the Battle of Sabbath Day Point some of whom were also ritually cannibalized before Montcalm managed to convince the Indians to instead send the captives to Montreal to be sold as slaves. Prelude Webb, who commanded the area from his base at Fort Edward, received intelligence in April that the French were accumulating resources and troops at Carillon. News of continued French activity arrived with a captive taken in mid-July. Following an attack by Joseph Marin de la Malgona work crew near Fort Edward on 23 July, Webb traveled to Fort William Henry with a party of Connecticut Rangers led by Major Israel Putnam, and sent a detachment of them onto the lake for reconnaissance. They returned with word that Indians were encamped on island in the lake about 18 miles from the fort. Swearing Putnam and his rangers to secrecy, Webb returned to Fort Edward, and on 2 August sent Lieutenant Colonel John Young with 200 regulars and 800 Massachusetts militia to reinforce the garrison at William Henry. This raised the size of the garrison to about 2,500, although several hundred of these were ill, some with smallpox. Siege While Montcalm's Indian allies had already begun to move south, his advance force of French troops departed from Carillon on 30 July under Elia Cute V.I.'s command, traveling overland along Lake George's western shore because the expedition did not have enough boats to carry the entire force. Montcalm and the remaining forces sailed the next day, and met with Elia Cute V.I.'s for the night at Ganaruska Bay. The next night, Elia Cute V.I.'s camped just three miles from Fort William Henry, with Montcalm not far behind. Early on the morning of 3 August, Elia Cute V.I.'s and the Canadians blocked the road between Edward and William Henry, skirmishing with the recently arrived Massachusetts militia. Montcalm summoned Monroe to surrender at 11 a.m. Monroe refused, and sent messengers south to Fort Edward, indicating the dire nature of the situation and requesting reinforcements. Webb, feeling threatened by Ali Acute V.I.'s, refused to send any of his estimated 1,600 men north, since they were all that stood between the French and Albany. He wrote to Monroe on 4 August that he should negotiate the best terms possible. This communication was intercepted and delivered to Montcalm. Montcalm, in the meantime, ordered Borlemac to begin siege operations. The French opened trenches to the northwest of the fort with the objective of bringing their artillery to bear against the fort's northwest bastion. On 5 August, French guns began firing on the fort from 2,000 yards, a spectacle the large Indian contingent relished. The next day a second battery opened fire from 900 feet further along the same trench creating a crossfire. The effect of the garrison's return fire was limited to driving French guards from the trenches, and some of the fort's guns were either dismounted or burst due to the stress of use. On 7 August, Montcalm sent Bougainville to the fort under a truce flag to deliver the intercepted dispatch. By then the fort's walls had been breached, many of its guns were useless, and the garrison had taken significant casualties. After another day of bombardment by the French, during which their trenches approached another 250 yards, Monroe raised the white flag to open negotiations. Massacre. The terms of surrender were that the British and the camp followers would be allowed to withdraw, under French escort, to Fort Edward, with the full honours of war, on condition that they refrain from fighting for 18 months. They were allowed to keep their muskets and a single symbolic cannon, but no ammunition. In addition, British authorities were to release French prisoners within three months. Montcalm, before agreeing to these terms, tried to make sure that his Indian allies understood him, and that the chiefs would undertake to restrain their men. 
This process was complicated by the diversity within the Indian camp, which included some warriors who spoke languages not understood by any European present. The British garrison was then evacuated from the fort to the entrenched camp, and Monroe was quartered in the French camp. The Indians then entered the fort and plundered it, butchering some of the wounded and sick that the British had left behind. The French guards posted around the entrenched camp were only somewhat successful at keeping the Indians out of that area, and it took significant effort to prevent plunder and scalping there. Montcalm and Monroe initially planned to march the prisoners south the following morning, but after seeing the Indian bloodlust, decided to attempt the march that night. When the Indians became aware that the British were getting ready to move, a large number of them massed around the camp, causing the leaders to call off the march until morning. The next morning, even before the British column began to form up for the march to Fort Edward, the Indians renewed attacks on the largely defenseless British. At 5 a.m., Indians entered huts in the fort housing wounded British who were supposed to be under the care of French doctors and killed and scalped them. Monroe complained that the terms of capitulation had been violated, but his contingent was forced to surrender some of its baggage in order to even be able to begin the march. As they marched off they were harassed by the swarming Indians, who snatched at them, grabbing for weapons and clothing, and pulling away with force those that resisted their actions, including many of the women, children, servants and slaves. As the last of the men left the encampment, a war whoop sounded, and a contingent of Abenaki warriors seized a number of men at the rear of the column. Although Montcalm and other French officers attempted to stop further attacks, others did not, and some explicitly refused to provide further protection to the British. At this point, the column dissolved, as some tried to escape the Indian onslaught, while others actively tried to defend themselves. Massachusetts Colonel Joseph Fry reported that he was stripped of much of his clothing and repeatedly threatened. He fled into the woods and did not reach Fort Edward until 12 August. At last with great difficulty the troops got from the retrenchment, but they were no sooner out than the savages fell upon our rear, killing and scalping, which occasioned an order for a halt, done in great confusion at last but... As soon as those in the front knew what was doing in the rear they again pressed forward, and thus the confusion continued and increased till we came to the advance guard of the French, the savages still carrying away officers, privates, women and children, some of which later they killed and scalped in the road. This horrid scene of blood and slaughter obliged our officers to apply to the French guard for protection, which they refused, told him they must take to the woods and shift for themselves. Joseph Fry estimates of the numbers killed, wounded, and taken captive during this time vary widely. Ian Steele has compiled estimates ranging from 200 to 1,500. His detailed reconstruction of the siege and its aftermath indicates that the final tally of British missing and dead ranges from 69 to 184. At most 7.5% of the 2,308 who surrendered. Aftermath On the afternoon after the massacre, most of the Indians left heading back to their homes. Montcalm was able to secure the release of 500 captives they had taken, but they still took with them another 200. The French remained at the site for several days, destroying what remained of the British works before leaving on 18 August and returning to Fort Carillon. For unknown reasons, Montcalm decided not to follow up his victory with an attack on Fort Edward. Many reasons have been proposed justifying his decision, including the departure of many of the Indians, a shortage of provisions, the lack of draft animals to assist in the portage to the Hudson, and the need for the Canadian militia to return home in time to participate in the harvest. Word of the French movements had reached the influential British Indian agent William Johnson on 1 August. Unlike Webb, he acted with haste, and arrived at Fort Edward on 6 August with 1,500 militia and 150 Indians. In a move that infuriated Johnson, Webb refused to allow him to advance toward Fort William Henry, 
apparently believing a French deserter's report that the French army was 11,000 men strong, and that any attempt at relief was futile given the available forces. Return of captives on 14 August, Montcalm wrote letters to Loudoun and Webb, apologizing for the behavior of the Indians, but also attempting to justify it. Many captives that were taken to Montreal by the Indians were also eventually repatriated through prisoner exchanges negotiated by Governor Vaudreuil. On 27 September a small British fleet left Quebec, carrying paroled or exchanged prisoners taken in a variety of actions including those at Fort William Henry in Oswego. When the fleet arrived at Halifax, about 300 people captured at Fort William Henry were returned to the colonies. The fleet continued on to Europe, where a few more former captives were released. Some of these also eventually returned to the colonies. Consequences General Webb was recalled because of his actions. William Johnson wrote that Webb was the only Englishman I ever knew who was a coward. Lord Loudon was also recalled, although this occurred primarily because of the failure of the Louisbourg expedition. Colonel Monroe died in November 1757, of apoplexy that some historians have suggested was caused by anger over Webb's failure to support him. Lord Loudoun, upset over the event, delayed implementing the release of French prisoners promised as part of the terms of surrender. General James Abercrombie, who succeeded Loudoun as commander-in-chief, was asked by paroled members of the 35th Foot to void the agreement so that they would be free to serve in 1758. This he did and they went on to serve under Geoffrey Amherst in his successful British expedition against Louisbourg in 1758. Amherst, who also presided over the surrender of Montreal in 1760, refused the surrendering garrisons at Louisbourg and Montreal the normal honours of war, due in part to the French failure to uphold the terms of capitulation in this action.